and it's really centered around like black led organizations. So whether it's a black led mm. school entity, a black led uh, nonprofit, I think that folks struggle to find dollars um, yes. and struggle to find supportive philanthropy, long term philanthropy. Um, to help, you know, with their organization's sustainability. I think that sometimes white-led organizations get the benefit of the doubt because of the relationship. So if they get money and they have failed projects, they might get a second chance or they might have other donors because of the relationships and connections. Black-led organizations don't always get that grace. Um, how can folks gain more access to funding? Welcome, welcome, welcome. You are listening to Building the Black Educated Pipeline podcast, the place where we talk to real people in the real struggle doing the real work. I'm your host, Shana Terrell, educator, activist, dedicated to the lifelong struggle of freedom and liberation for my people. Shout out to all my co-conspirators out there listening and watching today. We are super, super excited. Super excited. You've come for a treat. Today, we are joined by Dr. Stacey Holland, Executive Director of Elevate 215. Today, we will be discussing how to let the dollar circulate, okay? Philanthropy and education is definitely a topic that has really been on a shh, the hush and kept it secret, but we will be discussing that today with Dr. Holland. So welcome, 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 Dr. Holland. How are you? Well, thank you, co-conspirator. <laughs> Listen, you're the real co-conspirator of <laughs> the work, honey. This would be the talk. How do we, how we get this money out? Okay. You are the real co-conspirator of the work. Yes. We're excited to have you. So I've known you for some time, but I would love for you to tell um, our folks listening today a little bit about yourself. What can you share about who you are, your work past and present? Like, What should we know about Dr. Stacey Holland? Um, so I am the adult version of all the things we dream for for our children. Oh, I love that. And I am a, a, a zealot educator that really wants to build the institutions that serve our children. I am literally obsessed with the what does it take to actually build um, a ex excited next generation conspirator change agent um contributor to the world right I, and so the institutions have to be built a certain way in order to deliver the things that our young people need to help grow and develop them and usher them along their life's continuum so i you know i i in my mind i'm a yes i'm an educator and i'm very excited but i do consider myself a builder i like the side of uh, what do we vision? What do our young people need based on that vision? How do we build the experience for them? And how do we make sure those adults have everything they need to provide that experience with fidelity and consistently for all young people, not just a subset? Mm, I love that. I like that you see yourself as a builder. Can you elaborate a little bit? What did you mean when you said like you are all the things that we dream of for mm. our children? What is that? So I was the struggling learner. You know, I was what what they call the forgotten middle, the invisible middle. Mm. You know, good kid, uh, student leader, you know, violinist. I was taking over buildings when I, I was in a, a college. Like, I was all the thing. Um, but I wasn't a good student. Mm. No one knew that. Mm. I was just a good kid. I was, I was invisible. And so no one figured out I was not taking information in. I was not processing information. So if you looked at my grades, I almost didn't get out of high school. I got rejected from college. I didn't get into college oh, wow. on, on my own. I had to, I met my beloved, my, my, my college mentor, who's my life mentor, who was working at the college, saw something in me, right? He'd look at me and say, oh, your grades, oh, what's happening? That's when the SAT the minimum was 700. I got like, the minimum was like um, 700 and I got 400 for my name. So oh, like, I just, but we didn't, my, my mother didn't know. We didn't know, right? I just thought I wasn't trying hard enough. And mm -hmm. praise be to God that I ran into people along the way who guided me. Okay. And that's how I became an educator, right? I wanted to be what I saw and were making experiences for me. And because of them, I was able to find a career I was in love with, actually pursue higher education, 
um, get multiple degrees, have these experiences that I'm still to this day like, wow, I can't believe this happened. And it's only because somebody dreamed something, saw something for me and saw what I could be. Mm. And I didn't even know it. But see, right? your story is like so many of our young black girls. I say this a mm. lot. Um, a lot of research is done on young black boys and they get a lot of attention because of the disengagement uh, mm -hmm. that they have, you know, in the classroom. And because of, you know, boys are rambunctious, right? So they're going to act out that kind of stuff. Um, they're going to they're going to get attention. Right. In, in ways. That's right. <laughs> you will That's pay right. attention to me. Like, it's a good thing. Um, our young girls sometimes are often quiet and forgotten. So you 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 like hit the nail on the head when you said like. I was quiet. I was nice. I was a leader. I was cooperative. So everybody's like, oh, Stacey, mm -hmm. I wish I could have so many more of her. Mm -hmm. But nobody is talking about how you're struggling and ways to support you um, in that classroom, except for the few people who saw you That's um, right. and dreamed the dreams for you. So I love that. But you highlighted, uh, I think, a serious problem with the education um, that some of our girls who are more quiet and what folks would consider to be more cooperative but mm -hmm. are good learners, they get ignored or they get passed along because they're nice kids. That's right. Because that they're was nice me. girls. Mm -hmm. and that, that, was, that was me. And, you know, if we, we talk to our colleagues in the struggle, in the work, who work with kids with disabilities, you know, one of the things they'll tell you is that, and I'll give an example, ADHD, is, and boy shows up off the chain, right? They're off the chain. Part of that's develop, part of it's just where they are in their developmental continuum. And then they have this thing, this chemical imbalance showing off in their brain. Most girls, actually, it's opposite. They have all these things going on in their brain, but outwardly, they're actually quiet. Yep. So someone would have to look for something a little deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper. And what happens to those, those young ladies is because we don't talk about that for girls, and we're resilient and we're and we'll figure it out. Right. I'm an auditory learner. I didn't know what that term was till I was in my what? In late 20s. Right? I didn't know what that was. And so but I'm a musician. So I didn't know I was humming the stuff. I was humming the content. I was figuring out like, oh, OK, I'm visual. I'm drawing pictures out. Now I'm a flow chart. Okay. Right. If I take information up, people are like, oh, you're a systems thinker. No, I'm actually so the way I organize information in my ah. right. But if you ask me to read something, I cried every day <laughs> during my doctor degree. Every day. Because it's reading a bunch. That's all you it's do. It's just right? reading. It's just reading. I'm like, I don't know what this is, but I didn't understand. Right. So I think so many times in education, I translate this to our little people and our young people. I'm a high school girl, right? Those mm -hmm. are the kids I really, but we translate that into a behavior problem or we translate that into your emotional or we translate that into, okay, you don't have exactly your functioning skill. No, we need to look deeper because mm -hmm. they're probably frustrated. It just shows up different. Well, it, it shows the lack of diversity um, in how mm -hmm. we look at our young people as yeah. learners. Uh, education is very traditional and very rigid. A lot yes. of times, even when you enter conversations about diversity, and then you go into classrooms. How diverse is your classroom really? How diverse is your classroom set up for all learners um, and across the spectrum? Most of the and time, no, they're, they're not. <laughs> and nobody learns the same, right? Learning is a process. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten so, so, so emotionally wedded to, oh, we have to measure it by lagging indicators and these test scores and blah, blah, <laughs> blah. But what we're not doing is telling the truth around the process of learning. Yes. Learning is a process. Grounded in learning is psychological safety. Do mm -hmm. I trust you? Mm hmm Do you see me? Yep. Do you notice, hey, I actually can read a book, but, you know, as my, mo my mother would say, oh, go on and read a book somewhere, and you might spy me in a closet. I'm in a <laughs> closet, in a corner, but if you ask me to read, it took a long time for me to read and like out in public. Like to be comfortable with right? that. Right, to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, over time I figured out, oh, I'm theatrical for them. So I'm going to read all the things, right? Um, and that's how I'm going to get my attention. But I wouldn't seek attention in the classroom. Because that's, that's the place I felt the, I fe I had to hide. I couldn't tell anybody. Well, Stacey, you're really good. You're really smart. 
one of the activities I love doing when I go into career days or things in the schools or, you know, I'm giving talks in schools, I ask the kids, okay, here's my title. You know, I'm Dr. Stacey Hum. Tell me, let's build me as a kid. Who was? Oh, I know what they're saying. <laughs> oh, you were smart. You were student government. You were this, you were that. I'm like, yep, I was student government. Nope, I didn't really pass that class. Or oh, I think I got a D in that class. <laughs> okay. And so the whole point is life's a journey. You mm-hmm. have to learn yourself as a learner. I My dream for schools, and you can turn them into places of deep learning mm-hmm. that are iterative, right? Because learning takes time. Yes. After practicing, mm-hmm. um, which I don't necessarily get to do on a test, right? Yep. And how do we assess, how do we, how do we build a system that's guided by, how do we know our children? Mm-hmm. And I how want to... We- and I would love to just clarify because people will take these sound bites and say, Stacey Holland is against standardized testing. Like, that's not and at all. That's not what I'm saying. And, I and I'm so glad that. you clarified that. I am <laughs> yes. not against standardized testing. Mm-hmm. I think it tells us a story. And I think we need. Yep. And we know we actually need another set of metrics to answer the question, are children learning in real time? Yep. And what is that number telling us? Because it's probably telling us where to start, where they're stuck. Yep. It's not saying what they're capable of. Because guess what? The input of the material, the who is giving the material, the place in the material, a place where I learn the material, all matters. Matters. All All matters. So we have to give as much attention to that. And guess what? If you do that, you'll see the standardized test scores move Mm -hmm. because it's nothing but a thing. Yep. Right. But we've got to pay attention to the process of learning. So I, I so appreciate you for clarifying that. And the reason why I want to clarify that, because I think the narrative around this conversation needs to mm. switch. When people say things about standardized testing, it's not that they're against it. It just can't be the only thing. And I think that conversation and narrative needs to switch is like, hey, I'm not against standardized testing. Mm. testing. You're, you're an advocate of it. But are you against diversity, diversity in learning? Like nobody talks that or throws mm-hmm. that back at the, you mm-hmm. know, the, the people who are advocating for, for yeah. standardized tests. Um, you don't talk about the whole process of learning. Like what is your objective yes. and your view on the process of learning as opposed to just throwing standardized tests um, at children? So that's why I wanted to make that clarity mm-hmm. to the point because I think you're making an excellent point and I think you're making an excellent challenge to folks to look beyond testing. So then yeah, I want, and, want that sound bite. We- use it to diagnose and to change our practice. Absolutely. Right? It has to be a tool. But that's and the push. That's the that's push. The push. It's, that's the challenge. You yep. got to change. Um, and learning's real time. So if I'm not getting something today, because of the psychological fact in learning, you got to get me soon. You can't get me a year from Nope. Right? That, that's not a thing. I've already formed my identity around the subject. I formed what I thought. I've actually decided I can't do it. Do it. Yep. Ooh. Right. I decided. And so then what we do is push the work down the down the line to the next educator and the next school and and the next grade level and the next age. But now I have an identity. I can't do math. I can't do I I can't do that. So I don't know why you're asking me to do. Yeah. Right. So now the fight isn't the subject getting you to learn a subject. The fight is the identity. And the mindset, which is so hard to change at times when people mm-hmm. are stuck in a set of ways. Yeah, great points. Great points. You talked a little bit about mm-hmm. having educators that inspired you to be an educator, but is there a specific story or journey that really inspired you to say, like, a moment that said, like, I'm taking this career. I want to be an educator. Yes, and actually there's there's two. There's the one that my edu- my caring adult did for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was in college struggling. This was the same person that created, created a way for me to get to college. So I was, I am a proud product of the educational opportunity fund movement, um, or these educational access programs, right? Cause without that, there would be no Stacey Holland. There no would be do- no, no doctor, doctor no doctor Stacey there Holland. There would be no doctor, right? <laughs> yes. Um, and that, that gentleman, his wife. I proudly gave my dissertation. You are the only peer. Oh, I love that. It, it is because of you, 30 plus years later, because mm. of you, not mm. because of me, but because mm. of you. 
Um, mm. And I was failing. So we, I was an undergrad and I was failing calculus. I was a business major and I was failing calculus. And Mr. Boltwright would stand outside my classroom every Tuesday when I had class. Because he knew I cried two class, through class, and I was probably <laughs> crying when I left. Oh, no. And he would walk me to tutoring. Okay. Oh, that was kind. And he's, his words to me, and I'll never forget, he said, Stacy, you are not going to solve equations for a living. You are going to change my life. I love that. You just got to get through it. Get through this. And here's what you're going to do. And he introduced me to this world of, of access programs. So that's where I started my career in access programs. Um, and then fast forward, I'm in my first high school. Actually, the wonderful Auden Reed High School, the one that ah. I worked at full time um, when it was a district school. And I, to this day, is one of my favorite schools, even if it's current, in its current iteration. Just the community is rich. It was it was the underdog. No one you know, it was right next to Tasker Homes, right next to Alcorn. The community was known for, you know, not being a great community. And I have to tell you, I fell in love with these kids. And I had one young man um, who was brilliant. He was the neighborhood, you know, what, what he did. <laughs> yeah. And he would turn his class out. This class, and the class was down the hall from my office, and the teacher had no control. So, oh, I would always go down like, let me help this brother. Because, and Tyreek would be, you know, in the middle, right? Acting come to look up, come to look up his, uh, his, his scores. He had a almost perfect SAT math, perfect score. Smart, very smart. And what changed the game for me was the kids nicknamed me College Lady because I was the, <laughs> I was the college counselor and. And I was tracking every senior down and he would elude. Right? And so he's like the last senior to come find me. And I was like, I'm going to stalk you, man. I'm going to stalk you. <laughs> and I'll never forget, he showed up in my office one day after school. And you know what they do? They come in, they look at you, they talk, they say something smart, then I'm leave to test you out. Like, who are you going to be? And um, after about a month or so of him doing this, you know, he came and they sat down and he's like, college lady, do you think I could go to college? And I was like, yes, so let's talk. Yes, I do. He's like, I don't think I can go shopping. And I was like, why don't you think you're going to college? He goes, because college is for people like me. Hey, mm. College is for people like him. And so as we started in that moment, we are talking, and he's showing up more and showing up more, and he's asking more questions. And what occurred to me is I am in this moment changing a life. Mm -hmm. And it's the relationships that's changing the life. It's the patience that's changing the life. It's the skill set that's changing the life. It's seeing him, not seeing a number, not seeing a, a checklist. I see him. So, Terry, this is for me. This <laughs> is for me. Oh, and, you know, Ty, you know, this young man wasn't necessarily, I would say he was a success story for the fact that his mindset shifted. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know what happened to him, right? I know he graduated. We mm -hmm. did get him through high school. I don't know what happened to him, but I know that young man was thinking very differently by the time that school year had ended. That's what we have to do. We see. Mm -hmm. We see the nuggets. Yes. And then what happens? You're walking down Broad Street. You run into that kid. You, a College oh, lady. College <laughs> lady. <laughs> right. Or jobs lady. Like, you're the job lady. So along the way, the power in that, I fell in love with the fact that just by having a respectful conversation grounded in the possibility of who I knew he could be if he took a chance, mm -hmm. I saw that young man shift. And then that and, shifted for you. And that shifted for me. I was like, this is what I want to do. Oh, I love that. Yes. Educate a story and journey. <laughs> now. You had this untraditional path. You got into education, um, stayed there. One of the big things that I admire about you is that you got onto the philanthropy philanthropy scene. And that is big. Like when I talk, you saying like, let the dollar circulate. There's okay. money out there um, that people don't know, have, don't know that they have access to. Just It's just so much with philanthropy. So what inspired you to get to the money side? How did you get to the money side? Also, okay. people like you and I, 
You don't see us in the rooms with the money side. That doesn't happen often. So how did you get there? Um, so, I mean, I was recruited. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for like, the philanthropy, so we have to think about two ways. There's the management of public sector money, government money. Yep. I did that for a really long time. So I technically was in the funder space when I co-founded Philadelphia Youth Network. But it was all public money for the most part. Mm -hmm. It was a little private, but most of it was public. And that's a very different type of philanthropy, right? It's very regulated. It's it's all about scale. It's a lot of grant writing. You're not relate you're not relating in the same way that you do private philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And private philanthropy, I was recruited by Jared Fett and and his uh and his chair of the board, Dr. Keith Leaphart. We literally were in a meeting. Uh, at the school district, I was working for Dr. Hyde at the time, and we in a meeting, they were asking some questions around college and career readiness and career pathway work. And and so I was just answering the questions. And next thing I know, I'm getting a call from Dr. Leapart, like, hi, I think you're supposed to work for me. Oh, <laughs> I am? Why would I do that? <laughs> Why and would I, I do that? I want to shout out to Keith Leapart. Shout out to Keith. Uh, that's my <laughs> husband's cousin. Shout out okay. to Keith. <laughs> Yeah, and so I was like, oh, 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 okay. Um, you know, at the time I knew who Jerry Lenfast was, but I didn't know a lot about him. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Keith recruited me. I applied. It turned out. And so that was my first step. And, it, you know, I, I, I'm really pleased Keith chose to share a platform. Mm. And Jerry Lenfast who is like the original OG at Bye Bye, <laughs> is one of the, he was one of the most kindest, visionary, who was super humble and was like, tell me a story. That's what I want this money to do. Tell me a story about somebody's life that I take. Hmm. And as a person at Worst and Private Land, that's like the best gift you can get because they're honoring you. You. And your background, you know, Jerry say, Stacey, you think about this all day long. I don't ever think, I don't know anything except what I did with my own children. Mm -hmm. So I have to defer to you. I just ask that you tell me a story Mm -hmm. and that you're respectful and that you honor my likes I'm building. Okay. Um, So private philanthropy is very, and then there's the traditional route, right? There's an opening and then you apply and and you get it. It is a hard field to get in. Mm -hmm. And I was in at a time, I entered in at a time where there really weren't folks that looked like me. As of today, it actually looks very different, right? You do have some oh, more folks of color. I would say not a lot, but you do have some more, more folks, folks that are leading philanthropies in there. So what challenges have you faced, though, being in this field? Like you talked about the public sector, right, where it's it's somewhat faceless because mm-hmm. it is a lot of writing of grants, uh, yeah. fulfilling RFPs, you know, like that kind of stuff. So yeah. what organization looks great on paper is generally who gets the money. There's a couple of tracks on how they monitor how you're doing with the money and measures that, you know, says whether you're going to get renewed again. Right. Public sector. But they have all of these different red tapes and doors set up. Mm-hmm. Private philanthropy is a lot about who you know, relationships you build, how people feel. So I can imagine some of the rooms that you stepped into, like either raise money or give money away. Mm -hmm. Um, How was that for you? Really, just like as a Black woman, being in that field, like what challenges did you face? (laughs) Ooh, the side, not the side. Yeah, the side. So the first thing is you really do have to realize you're in rare like this is rarefied. Mm. It's not your money. Mm. You are representing mm. whether it's of a donor, right? I work directly for a donor, or it is an independent philanthropy, like a few, where there's still living donors on the board, right? But it's so big that, you know, at the end of the day, the average person doesn't interact with them. So it's considered independent philanthropy. And and or a corporate philanthropy, right? And so the first rule of thumb, a, an elder told me this when I came in, is just remember it's always a we never know. Mm. You control nothing. Your job is to educate and influence what decisions are made. You are the best spokesperson. And I think that was probably the best lesson I learned going 
because I really was, okay, well, I'm trying to solve a problem. The second part is you got to be very clear about the priorities of the institution in which you work for. Mm. You may or may not be able to shape. I was fortunate. Jerry and their board had decided, we know we want to work on early learning, middle school, and career pathways for high school kids. But beyond that, we're open. But there are some institutions that are very clear. I will only do X, X, and X. And I think many people walk into those rooms and they think they're going to gain. So you got to set yourself up to win when you go in. Understand the priorities of your institution. And then you have the third part. And the third part is, I always viewed my role as, how can I help folks get access to this resource that they wouldn't otherwise have access? Because the it, the big institutions are going to get access. The larger organizations will get access because they can write all the grants and they have connections. But the smaller ones cannot, which means I've got to go find them mm. and then I've got to market them to my board and make sure they meet all the criteria. And sometimes, you know, I went as far as to say, hey, I love you. I love your program, but I can't use anything you gave. Mm. So let me help you. And, and, I, and I always start with this question, may I have permission? Or what role would you like me to play? Would you like me to listen? Well, listen, if you want to adjust and learn, I'm, I'm ready to teach. But I want you to make the choice, knowing, and the last part is there's no guarantees, right? You can pitch something to your board because your board's the ultimate decision maker. You can pitch something and it may fly, may not. Now, if I've done my job as the staff person, Literally, I have shepherded it along the way, which means it's a lot of due diligence. Mm -hmm. And then, Shannon, here's the other. There's not enough money in Philadelphia to go around, and no one wants to hear that. We are a philanthropic light city. Mm -hmm. When you compare that to a New York or a Boston or a D.C. or even Pittsburgh, their foundational presence, their donor presence, it's 10 times ours. Yeah, I think it's like six millionaires in all of Philadelphia, maybe, if that now. Six billionaires? Billionaires. I know. Yeah, there's more like millionaires, that. but it's definitely the billionaire class. Yes, it's like only six of them. And guess what? At the end of the day, they have feelings. This is the other thing. Like, so you mentioned <laughs> this idea of feelings. And feelings are a real thing. They like, are. The donor has real feelings and real ideas. So now I'm on the other side where I'm raising money, right? Mm -hmm. I'm raising money to give money away, mm -hmm. but I still have to raise money, right? Yes. And so donors, they do, they're very clear where they want to give their money and they're very clear about their ideologies behind it. Yes. Very few of them come with no idea. Like, ooh, stay fan doesn't like you. Let me just give you this money. Do what you want with it. Nope. No. And once you get it, you have to hustle. You have to do, you have to be... Uh, a woman or man of your word. When they did you do you. the did you do the thing that you committed to do? Mm -hmm. Because you've got to tell that donor a story with their money. Yes, because they feel very deeply about what did or did not do with their money. Mm. And the district is a very good tale of right. People feel very strongly about public education. Strong, like they, <laughs> I believe it's the beginning, the end. I believe it's the gatekeeper. They. Lots of feelings. They give the money to the district. I Listen, I have, what, 33 years worth of stories, right? Give the money to the district, and then you encounter them 10 years or five years after they gave the money. The project didn't go well because the leadership changed. And the principal changed. Nobody listened to them, but you took my millions, and Oof. they they have feelings about it. Yeah. And you just happen to be the one to get it five years later. Mm -hmm. Like, well, actually, I don't work for the district. I actually, <laughs> I actually like they're trying to make the case that they're looking at you like, um, well, no. philanthropy, that makes it another side of it, right? It could be a very messy um, place um, because of how be. money is exchanged and, and handed down. I, I call it the long term. The long term date. Why do you call it that? Date. As you know, when you first meet somebody, you're kind of like, oh, you're cute. Mm -hmm. hey, and you're thinking about it from the perspective of, oh, I think I might align with you. Mm -hmm. I think you. I think your feelings and my feelings and what we want to do really match. Mm -hmm. So you start with the, oh, I think you did. And then you, then you begin building a relationship. Hey, can I understand your priorities? Mm. Hey, can I share with you what I do? 
Oh, and the third meeting, can I show you what I do? Fourth, hey, do you think this is a match? Do you think maybe we can get engaged? <laughs> Engage, engagement is the, yep, you're invited to apply and mm -hmm. we're going through a process. But marriage don't come <laughs> until that is that the that proposal is on the board docket like it, yep. because it's a 90% chance it will get through. Mm -hmm. Right. That that's where Ben and then after they say the philanthropy says, yeah, then we're married. We're married. Now we're what happens in marriage? I gotta maintain. Yes. It's a lot right? of work. It's, work. it's a lot of work. It's now work. I am not. I'm not married, which is why I'm still back at the <laughs> <laughs> but, but but the reality of it is any relationship is work. Mm -hmm. And I think people forget that. Specifically like, well, you know, you know, and I used to have to tell Jerry this all the time and, and other philanthropists that I've advised over time, because it's a long term date and when we get married, I need you to be clear when you don't want to be married to me anymore and that grant ends. I have to go ask somebody else. Yes. I don't generate revenue. I don't have any way to raise money that runs my enterprise. Mm -hmm. So you are my way, which means I've got to manage you. Mm -hmm. And then when our relationship ends, I got to go find somebody, somebody else. else. Yes. All of that, right? Makes it so complicated. So then that brings me to the next question I have. And it's really centered around like black led organizations. So whether it's a black led mm. school entity, a black led uh nonprofit, I think that folks struggle to yeah. find dollars. Um yes. and struggle to find supportive philanthropy, long term philanthropy, um, to help, you know, with their organization's sustainability. I think that sometimes white led organizations get the benefit of the doubt because of the relationship. So if they get money and they have failed projects, mm -hmm. they might get a second chance or they might have mm -hmm. other donors because of the relationships and connections. Black led organizations don't always get that grace. Mm -hmm. um, how can folks gain more access to funding? So Shami, you, there's a lot in that. So I'm not trying to be brief and, and answer it as briefly as I so mm -hmm. you are 100 percent right. Right. I think the thing we have to remember is that the white led organizations in size and scale tend to be much larger that are accessing these philanthropic dollars. Mm -hmm. And the donor they're accessing has what? Friends. Yes. They're friends. Then they're brought into the enterprise and this this white led organization that is larger in size and scale. Opera Philadelphia, Philadelphia Orchestra, um, you know, at, at Jefferson, Drexel University, University of Pennsylvania. The network is really, really, really mm -hmm. in terms of their, their philanthropic money. But here's the other thing with the, the what they're delivering is of interest to this crew. Mm -hmm. That's a thing. When you get these black led organizations that are middle to small size, they don't have the same donor pool in that same donor pool. They don't have a group of friends. Mm. So they're more reliant on the independent philanthropy. Yes. OK. Independent philanthropy is um, finite here. There's only so much you can do gain from independent philanthropy. And national philanthropy goes where the wind goes. They change a lot. Folks are seeing that now. They I change a lot. Folks are seeing that right now. Folks are seeing that right now because when uh, COVID happened and Joy Floyd happened, I mean, the money was pouring in. Yes, and now it was. people are seeing those dollars dry up nationally. I just want to make make that point. No, that, and you're 100% accurate, right? So now what happens, The these organizations need to build out a network of people who are committed to their cause in order to keep them long-term, but they don't look like them. And the organization doesn't have the mechanism and the network to go out and get them. Get them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's important. It's one of the reasons why in our funding strategy, we're very intentional of equal number of district, equal number of charter. Got to make sure that organizations that are led by people of color are equally represented or we're doing things independently for them. Like we're, we're very intentional. Mm -hmm. And some philanthropies are and some are not. Yes. Okay. 
So now you got that, well, what do I do? What do, what do I do as the organization lead? And the organization lead is they've got to, and this isn't, this isn't great, but they've got to figure out how to get to those networks of donors who are interested in their cause. They've got to get that donor to expand their network. But you've got to sell something. Mm. And this is where we are not good. It's a cultural thing, meaning, meaning we are independent by nature, right? We figure it out. We put our head down. Philanthropy is a lot of selling. Well, it's it, a lot of creating a case. It's a lot of proof point. It's a lot of targeting the right person. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of network, mm-hmm. right? And then if you're doing that, you're not doing the work, mm. right? In our communities, we want, we're doing the work. The work. That's what I was going to say. Like we're, we're doing we're the, doing work. the work. And our cause and the things that sometimes we want to solve for us is just like, well, why wouldn't you invest in this? Right? Like it's not yeah. a, like, why am I selling that I need That's help right. for black kids to read? Why, do, why am I selling that I need help? Um, for a better quality of life for children. Why am I selling? I got to sell that to you. Why am I selling yes. that? Like that. And I, I understand. I overstand that. Mindset. I am not thrilled to have to say that. So let me just on that, you know, in my perfect world, mm-hmm. my perfect world, there's kind of like a donor exchange and there's somebody saying, okay, you know what? Go get this person, this person, this person. And these are the organizations that we think you should support. And then working with the organization, this is how you need to, need to build a case for them. Yes. And this is how you need to build partnership. Now go back to Felix. So we think, why did I got to sell that? I don't think I have to sell that. But the truth be told is the donors actually feel some kind of way about the thing you're doing. They actually, they like that. You know, so the point is, it's not that you're selling. You're basically bringing them into their world, your world, so they can see what you see. There you go. And then, yes, you have to build a business case. And this is the last point, which is so unpopular. But I think it's important for us to talk about. We've got to build institutions that can be sustainable. Mm. So I take schools. If you cannot build a school that can sustain on the per people funding, most schools cannot, then you've got to set a target. I need 200000 above my per pupil revenue. I know I can bring in my per pupil, but I need this 200000 more. So what am I going to do to get it? And I have to be intentional about it. If I don't get it, then I'm not going to, this is what's going to not happen for kids. Mm -hmm. And now I got to go find a group of people that are going to help me get the $200,000, right? Whether it's fundraise, whether it's direct events, whether it's I'm networking through your board, whether it's I'm writing grants, or whether it's I'm actually going to go actually build a circle of investors um, and I have access to them. So, but you got to be intentional. Mm-hmm. And I would love to see us being more intentional about it. I think, you know, Kelly Woodland over the United Way, through his Black Executive Leaders Network, he is killing the game. A ref. He has created funder events. There's over a hundred plus, you know, EDs that are there. He's creating access for them for folks to meet people. Which is great. He's like solving something that has been elusive for years. Um, he's doing a lot of professional development, a lot of access. So that's what we need. And I, But it's not accessible to everybody. Like school leaders, that's not accessible to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I'm thinking, okay, what do I need to do over as a school-facing organization? I do something like that. For them. Support that. Yes. And the thing I'm thinking about, especially there's, there's two things I feel like in um, organizations that are pain points. One is the sustainability plan, because most of the time it has to do with funding. And two is generally usually a succession plan. Sure. And the hard part about a succession plan, like if your money maker is leaving the organization, what do you do? Right. Like that affects your sustainability plan. But I think that folks don't even know where to start. So thank you for that example that you gave. Um, about the per pupil for sustainability, because I think that is where folks mm-hmm. struggle. Because if you're leading yeah. an organization that is in support of children and improving mm-hmm. their quality of life, you want to dream the major dreams for them, right? Like this, mm-hmm. you want to feel like I can, I can spare no expense. Like they're going to get whatever they need, and we're going to do whatever it takes. But then your organization is ran down into the ground um, after mm-hmm. ten years. You ain't got no money. You know, <laughs> you spent it all up. Um, So are there any like pro tips that people should be using when they're thinking about sustainability? Yes. So the first thing is 
work with your team and your community to be very clear about the vision you have and do it in three, five, and seven year tranches. And you should refresh it every three years. The second, mm-hmm. you have to operationalize it to make sure the performance is there. People do not pay because they feel they pay, they pay their money into a project because they're producing. So producing is is key. Now producing, and I'll use kids because it's the one I knew best. If you are showing a story of growth, that's producing. And this is where the different, but the standardized test score says something else. The public sees standardized test score. So you now got to educate them about growth. Hey, mm-hmm. let's look at growth because I'm actually winning. I'm winning. My kids are moving. Mm-hmm. Right. Standardized test score is a whole nother world. But let us be a place where you can enter into partnership with us to move these kids. So you've got to figure out that story. The third thing, you got to have a financial plan. And I would say, I would say 90% of the organizations I've ran into that don't have sophisticated and experienced development staff and financial staff don't have this. Mm. You've got to articulate, you've got to plan to get this, get this outcome. How much is it going to cost me year over year above my guaranteed revenue? Mm. And remember, nonprofits have no guaranteed revenue, nope. right? Unless you're living off an endowment, something like that, which almost no one is. So all that being said, how much money do I need? I need a, I just went through this exercise. I've got a three-year budget. <clears throat> and, I, and I've broken it down by division. I've broken it down by initiative within that division. Mm-hmm. So as the ED, know your numbers. And specifically, <laughs> us folks of color. And every new ED I say this to, do not ever not know your numbers. Mm-hmm. They'll say, well, that's the finance job. Nope, it's your job. Because how do you know you have somebody that doesn't that knows what they're doing? Yep. Know where every dime goes. Mm-hmm. Every dime. The second is know where your anticipated gaps are, adjust your expenses, and build a fundraising plan. And you know what that means, which is the thing that nobody likes to do, including me. You gotta get out and sell. Gotta be begging for the money. I wanna be out with schools, I wanna be out with the builders, I wanna be out coming with solutions. But I spend at least 50 to 60 percent of my time doing that. So you've got to have a function in the organization that's dedicated to that. And I have development staff. Mm. So we got to tell the truth about that. Set yourself up to win. Mm. Set yourself up to win. Find other organizations that you think are doing it well. Call that ED. Say, hey, can I can have a 30 minute talk. 30 minutes. I just want to know how you do it. How'd you get started? What's your infrastructure? How much is costing you? How much are you, are you making to your effort? I think this is great advice, great advice, because again, I don't, I don't know if people think it through as intently um, as that. I think we, we want to, we say we do, yeah. but we don't, especially the, um, how to break down your budget within three to five years in the revisions. I just, I think sometimes, especially if you're in a nonprofit, people can't see past the year you're in, you know, like, no, you just, that is true. you're going, can't see past the year you're in, like, all right, we make it through this year. I got a plan to raise money. And then sometimes your plan is not like a real plan. It's like, I'm going to talk to these couple people and hope they say yes. Right? Like, it's just, <laughs> that's how it is sometimes. Like, these couple people will give me a couple dollars. I yes. know they got money. They're going to be, all right, I'm going to give me some money. Right? Yes. So not really yes. thinking as thoroughly as three to five years. Make sure the money that you get within one year can last three to five years so that while you're in that second year, you're working on the next three to five years beyond that. It's a constant churn, right? Yes. And you, you hit it the head, nail on the head. And you've got to build that into your organizational Organization. function. Yes. And we don't, we tend not to do that. Mm-hmm. And if we're year to year, you can't run a business year to year. Mm-hmm. You've got to run. I'm raising money for three years out. Yes. Right? I'm getting through this year, but the fact of the matter is, I really should be raising for next year, not this year. Yes. And I do also want to make this point of clarity. Like we're not sitting here saying like black people can't do and don't do these things. I want y'all to understand that like research has shown us what has happened to our black led organizations. Um, And it's not due to in some type of like incompetency with black people, right? That's the word that gets thrown around a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a lack of training. Um, It's a lack of access. It's a lack of opportunity. Yes. Also the lack of like, you don't have time to fail, right? In your mind, right? 
like some of these organizations start out with tons of dollars or say fails, right? Like mm-hmm. if they, they run out of money, somebody that's going to bail them out or back them up, right? For us, we don't always have that. So our first three to five years starting out when organizations don't last, you didn't, you didn't have a cushion to fall back on. Like that isn't all the way on you, but we do need to educate ourselves and we do need to do better with planning um, when we're building out our organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, sometimes because we feel like, especially in the nonprofit space, like we want to do something for our community and starting a nonprofit is the way to do it. And we're not always educated on the business side of what a nonprofit is. I think people only see business in a for-profit sector because that's how you make money. Yep business. But I think in the nonprofit sector, people don't see it as a business when it is. Um, so definitely wanted to to point that out. So something that you get to see a lot of or know a lot of because you spend a lot of time with these people are actual, fun- you're an actual funder, number one, but mm-hmm. you spend a great mm-hmm. portion of your career with funders. What are some things that they want to see in an organization? Um, for? Like, What are they attracted to? Right? Like, yep. What kind of things are they like? That's a red flag. I'm not doing that or like, yes. yes, I want to see these things within the organization and I'm going to give my money. Great question. Because <laughs> most people don't ask that. So here's the, sh- the some quick tips. The first and foremost, they're looking for someone that can articulate what they do. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me what you do in five minutes? And actually, I n- now have it down to three. Let's go. <laughs> because you're trying to get someone's attention. Mm-hmm. The second is you actually have to research that donor, research that philanthropist. Don't approach somebody that invests in technology and you're running a environmental science. Mm. A doesn't equal B. It needs to match. And there's a lot of information. There's whole databases on donors and what their interests are. Literally, I have a person on my staff. Her One of her big jobs is the research team. Mm. And I get a five to seven page briefing before every single meeting. This is who they are. This is what they've done. Here are their areas of interest. Here are their kids. Here's the things that they've said they like or don't like. Like it's a whole history. So you have to do some research before you do it. Mm -hmm. Third, practice your pick. Be clear about what you are asking. And it starts very general. May I have, can we meet so I can share what we do? Um, I think there's some interesting synergies Notice I did not say we're a good match for you. Mm-hmm. I would not say that. That's never a good thing to say. It's never a good thing. Because mm. you don't know. You know what's on a website. So that's really important. Lastly, this is it's a long-term date. You are building a relationship with that person in the philanthropy. Stop and ask a question. <laughs> okay. You know, how do you come to this work? What what did you find interesting, if anything? Um, can you, you know, what I'd really love to be able to do is kind of run ideas by you and then maybe you'll hear something that clicks. Mm. Um, I'm really looking for funding for this. If it doesn't fit with you, can you refer me to somebody? Do you know of another organization? So, and rehearsing that. Many people get in and they just think they're having a chit chat, but they don't understand they're talking to somebody who actually, hey, I've got to find 10 organizations that are going to do A, B, C, and D by this day because I'm trying to get do due diligence to go to board. Like they have a process they're running through. Mm. And mo- a lot of people, doesn't matter, black or white, they'll come to you with like, well, I think that's it. So, you know, where where can I apply? <laughs> well, you can't. <laughs> you can apply. Oh, so, no. What type of philanthropy are you talking to? I'm invitation only. Oh, good so, point. The, matter of fact, tomorrow we invited 15 schools to apply for three grants. Mm. And we go through a process. Tomorrow's the info session. Now, we've done a lot of due diligence. We know more about them than they know yeah, about I'm themselves sure. at this mm. point. And they definitely don't know a lot about us. Mm-hmm. So be deeply curious when you go into these conversations because it's really important. Um, and be authentically you, but come with some proof points like, hey, you know, I serve, uh, you know, I start, it took almost a year and a, a year and seven, to, I would say a year and seven months to get our pitch right. Mm. And so I was testing it. Over and over. That's, that's a wow. Right. 
and, and I've had marketing professionals, hey, can I say this to you? Hey, can I test this with you as a donor before I go out and I'm sitting with Mr. Billionaire has may have never had a conversation with a black educator before, serial entrepreneur. They're looking at me like, what? Like, what? <laughs> what you doing here? <laughs> right. Yes, we still get those. We still you, get those. How you get in this room, ma'am? <laughs> but you know what's funny? The thing I found to break the ice, and this is another another tip. Find a place of intersection. Mm. And the one, my one favorite question is, oh, you know, I understand you have, um, do you have young people in your life? Mm. And inevitably, oh, go, you know, what's your names? And, you know, how were they as kids? And, oh, my gosh, they go on and on and on. And you, I've never heard somebody say, oh, my kid, what, kid was a menace. Oh, my God, that one <laughs> took me out. And this one I loved to death. And all oh, the my favorite was this gentleman who said, oh, my God, I have, I have X number of kids and the majority of them almost took me out. Of, <laughs> they almost took me out, Stacy. And let me tell you what he did. And then and he said, but now they're the loveliest humans. They're adults and they have families and I love them. And they didn't think I'm... Yes, <laughs> That's right. So then we start, start you know, talking vibing about that and, and talking about that. Because here's at the core of it. I know we're in the season where they're, where we're very racially aware. Mm-hmm. But can I tell you something? Everybody has a story. Mm-hmm. We meet in the intersection of humanity. Absolutely. And if we can, even the ones who've been challenging, mm-hmm. if I can find that place of humanity, we're fine. And then I can tell the truth. When you find the ones you don't vibe with, thank you very much. And we got to move on. And we got to move on. And that's fine, too. Because you, like, you're asking for a toxic, abusive, uh, funding relationship. You want to keep going down that road with them. I want you to be in love with our kids. Mm-hmm. I want you to be in love with them. Mm. I want you to help me co-create an experience for them. Love that. Right? Yes. And so I, it took me a long time to get to that, Sheena. I didn't mm-hmm. get to that overnight. So I shared that as a, as a um, place of proof point through a journey. To get there. Yep. To get there. I want you to be in love. Are you in love? I want you to be excited. Or if you're not in love with them, are you in love with me? <laughs> you got to have some type of investment in me or them. And let me tell you something. A lot of, you know, invest, number one rule of investment is you're investing in the leader. Mm-hmm. Right? And so them being excited about me is a, is a big thing. Deal. That's a big deal. That's I a big deal. That. Um. There are like two, there's so much more that I like want to get into. And again, I said this at the top of the show. We do not talk about philanthropy and education. We do not give people the guide or the tour on how to access money uh, or ways to be marketable, or ways to be investable. Yes. We don't talk about that enough, especially not in black and brown less spaces. Um, a lot of times I think we hone in on the problem. And whether we we want to talk a lot about how money, money, money is a big factor on how we fix those problems because we need resources. Yes. Um, So we just don't speak about it enough. But this next question, I'm not trying to kill anybody's dreams. Um, I know we like dream big and we want to do all the things. But I do think when you're going after money, you have to consider what a fundable project is. I think everybody in mind like wants to start and do something. But everything is not a fundable project. Um, so what have you seen where, where schools or organizations make the most impact with their dollar investments? What kind of projects? They are very articulate about the problem they're trying to solve. I'm trying to solve middle school math. I'm trying to solve getting kids to eighth grade, uh, getting them to eighth grade algebra because it's a gatekeeper course mm. to high school. They're very clear about the second thing. They're very clear about how that. And here's what I'm going to do about it. If I am and I'm using a project we're we're funding right now, if I'm going to solve the problem and I'm going to do it in partnership with five other schools, with five schools, because if I just do it for myself, the numbers aren't interesting enough for a funder. Mm -hmm. And truth be told is it's going to cost less if I do it with more. Mm -hmm. So be clear about the problem you're trying to solve. One school trying to solve it, and then they happen to be in a coalition. They're like, oh, we're trying to solve that, too. We should do it together. So they're trying to solve middle eighth grade math. But in order to do that, they had to go back to sixth and seventh grade. 
Mm-hmm. So we need curriculum. We need assessment. We need professional development. We need real-time assessment. We need professional development to show us what, what the assessments are saying. And, oh, yeah, we need, we need immersion activities, skill acceleration immersion activities. So we need Saturday boot camps. We need sun, summer programs. We need things where we can teach kids the skills and accelerate. All right, fine. And make it fun. So they had a clear problem they wanted to solve. They were articulate about what they wanted to do. And they were also articulate about how we're going to make this doable by the cost of the cost. But if we do it by a single site, it's too expensive. So let's go get multiple sites. So they had a real budget. Mm. And then they had real outcomes. We want to get X percentage of our kids who are eligible through out for one and pass the keystone. Yes. Awesome. You know, now for me, that's a win for me. And this is the thing people got to be clear about when they're pitching projects. The, the philanthropy needs a win. Yes. They want to get so success gonna, with their money. I'm going to add some frame to your question around not everything is a fundable project. I would add it like you have to build a project that's a win for you and for the funder. Mm-hmm. And this was Jerry's thing. Tell me a story. Tell me a story. <laughs> I love so it. So it has to be fun. So you have to have a project that is clear. The intervention is clear. The metrics are clear, meaning what's the outcome is going to be that you're predicting. Remember, investment is all of it's a risk analysis. Mm-hmm. And then you actually have to have a budget. And the last thing that's very important, you have to have the person who can sell it. Not sell it in a sales mini way, but in a content. Mm-hmm. And you've got to know about what's interesting for that donor. Stop trying to sell something to somebody that that's not what they do. That's not what they want. But if it is what they do, then realize then you are in a competition. With other folks. Because you're in a competition with other folks. Other people are going to come with some, again, ideas too. But what you just did, you helped me not kill people's dreams. Dream what you want to dream. But be able to do that layout that uh, Dr. Holland just laid it out. If you if that's your dream, make sure that you can sell it. Make sure it's a win. All of those things you laid out. So I didn't kill y'all dreams just yet. She didn't say these aren't fundable projects or this isn't a fundable project. She said anything. Just make sure you lay it out um, in a way that she named. This last thing I want to I want to do. Then we're gonna wrap. Um, and this might be a longer question. This might be a whole show of a question, but let's let's try to do it briefly. Mm-hmm. Of course, we are on building the Black Educator Pipeline. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that we have been searching for are how mm-hmm. we build more strategies to fund yep. teachers, period. Um, yep. But for us, our special interest is Black teachers. How can we get more strategies funded to get Black teachers in the classroom? Mm-hmm. Like, what would you, what would Stacey Allen, what would Elevate 215 support or suggest? So here's what we suggest, and in some cases, support, right? Uh, um, so the, the first is, and, and I think the center has done a really good job of it. I think the Talent Coalition, who's focused on this particular, it's a citywide coalition, and they're mm-hmm. focused on it. They actually are looking at this very topic. How can we diversify and how can we specifically this focus on, you know, Black teachers? So here are some of the things we know that research tells us that actually work. The first thing this early exposure is super, 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 super important. I am, I am a proud member of the Freedom School founding coalition back in 2000, mm-hmm. right? When there were 22 freedom schools, when we saw literacy rates go up. But you know the unspoken story about that. We saw those high schoolers and those college interns become educators. Hey, we yeah. watched them. We literally watched them. I was one of them. <laughs> it, so, and it's the experience, right? I'm immersed in it. I fall in love with it. I see, I could see myself in a space. You can't see it, you can't be it. So creating these opportunities for early exposure by interacting in the learning process with another learner mm-hmm is really important and we need to do that far and wide. The second thing we need to do is we really got to, quite frankly, we've got to market the teaching profession. We're actually working on a teacher campaign right now, marketing campaign citywide, where we're hopeful that the the mayor will be able to, will be able to get behind it and we can, we can help 
use her experience as a teacher to kind of sell the story. But we've even got to let people know it's possible. Third, you absolutely have to, and this is the unpopular one, but we've got to change teacher prep programs. Mm -hmm. So we're preparing people to go into the classroom more um, with better skills and we can retain them. But we can also recruit them, which is really important. And I think recruiting in the undergrad level and or the grad level is important. Converting. There are many people in our schools who are actually not teachers, but they're paraprofessionals. They're the folks that love our kids, know our kids, are with our kids, and have started a degree and or not finished a degree, and in some cases finished it and didn't pass the practice. Mm -hmm. We need to convert them, which means we've got to give them tuition dollars and build alternative to certifications so that way we can actually get them through the process easier. And in a research study we just did, this is, the, this is another strategy. The research study we just did around um, teacher retention, recruitment and retention, we wanted to know the state of teachers. And we had 784 teachers actually respond to this very interesting poll. And we found Black teachers were leaving the classroom because of their loan. Mm. So that's something we can lobby for at the state and the Fed levels is accelerate loan forgiveness for teachers that are in the classroom. They want to stay Black teachers because our white teachers who didn't have debt stay. They got the, the they, income is even. Look, our folks got to eat. Like, yes. I got to eat. So I can't do this with, um, we, I can't do this with this level of debt. Yep. And the last thing I would say that's really important, because this is for those of us in the education field that are advising our young people that are interested in teaching, have them travel a path in their higher ed journey that's affordable. Mm-hmm. I got a college student right now, which uh, I'm just, um, you know, she chose a school where she's in a lot of debt. Mm-hmm. And she's coming out with a degree that doesn't make a lot of money unless you happen to get to the upper echelons of the of the profession, of which what she didn't realize is you're actually come you're coming out in the phase of your career where you're in the hustle mm-hmm. and you're not gonna be able to afford your mm-hmm. your your loan payments, but you didn't listen when we told you don't did it. Yep. Go to this school because it's more affordable. So We've got to get our kids, our young people thinking more strategically. If you want to go into education, what's a good program you can pursue without you going into so much debt yeah. because you're enamored, you're enamored with the, with the institution. institution, with the school. Great point. And this is the last thing, because I do think this is super important, Shana, and it's the thing we never talk about. Mm-hmm. Schools and districts have got to change the way we teach, treat teach. Absolutely. We had, you know, if you're in the corporate sector, one of the number one things they talk about is their workforce initiatives around supporting their workforce. Mm-hmm. And they're very clear that their workforce is their number one asset. Mm. We've got to change our educational system to be able to make our teachers and our, you know, school staff, our school leaders, all the administrators, all the support staff, you are the center of the universe because you are taking care of our babies. Let's take care of these kids. Yep. So we need to change our condition. We need to change our attitude. We need to elevate and make this a profession of highest esteem. Mm-hmm. Um, and we as a society have to do yeah. that. And for our Black teachers, if we look historically, when the economy didn't give us lots of options as Black folks, we could be what? A nurse? A teacher? Or you're going into like the post office or government. Mm-hmm. You might be a lawyer. There were a few that were able to be a doc, right? At the very, very, very beginning when segregation was still a thing. Mm -hmm. All that being said, guess what? We don't have any limits anymore. And it's part of the reason why we're not seeing people go in the field. Yep. So we have to be intentional about that in our community of elevating and inspiring and connecting people to a field that created us, Mm -hmm. right? And and so we just have to have a whole different approach to it. I love it. Yes. And just to piggyback off that point about how we treat teachers, when we did our campaign, um, when the Senate did the campaign for We Need Black Teachers, what we found is a lot of young people said there they didn't go into the classroom because they see how teachers are treated as well. That was a part of like, why would I want to work here? And my teacher's stressed out every day. So great, great point.
So before we wrap, we always give our guests the opportunity to thank a Black teacher or thank some Black teachers. So I just want to give you the floor to do that uh, before we go. Current teacher or any teacher? Any teacher. So, yeah, so I, I got a list. So, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I know I'm going to thank people who started out as teaching and now at different phases of their career. I always have to thank my, my Pat and, and, and Jim Boatwright because they are the reason why I, I am standing here before you today. You know, I think about the people that I know serve every day, you know, the Dr. Penny Nixon, the Dr. The Aaliyah Br- Bradley's um, epic. Soon, I think about, you know, the Claudia, Dr. Claudia Lyles at Keystone. I think about, um, I think about my folks like Ray Fields, who's now doing something else and now is at the state. I, you know, I, I, there's so many to thank, right? And I just want to thank Everybody who chooses to get up every day and pour into our kids. And whether it's because they were inspired for their journey, because they feel it was a calling, I just want folks to know that we are deeply indebted and grateful to you, for you, and we serve with you. Oh, Stacy, thank you. Listen, thank you to all my co-conspirators out there who joined us today to learn about how to let that dollar circulate. So, of course, this podcast, Build a Black Educated Podcast, is a show hosted by the Center for Black Educated Development with the help from our partners at Bright Beam. Subscribe and listen to wherever you get your favorite podcasts. We'll see you here next time, everybody. Peace. <laughs>